Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for Handmade Chelsea Online. Right now we're being joined by Helen and Charlie from Malin Island who are going to take us through some of the processes and techniques that they use to create their wonderful bronze sculptures. Uh, we'll also hear about some of the inspirations and ideas that they use and hopefully get to see some of the printing techniques that they're doing also, <laughs> which will be fantastic. As always, please feel free to ask questions um, by asking them in the chat box provided and we'll get through to them during the, the show. So over to you guys. Well, thank you so much. And um, thank you everybody for joining us. We are in a really wet, rainy, windy, uh, um, workshop today, uh, but um, it's so brilliant to be able to, to chat to you from here. We are going to, uh, I'll tell you a wee bit about the, the sculptures and where the ideas for them came from, and then Charlie's going to talk you through the technicalities and the process of how he makes them. Um, so, Charlie's been a metal worker for years and years. And All my life, pretty much. And had always wanted to get into bronze casting, really. It was a yeah. thing you'd been really. Uh, keen to try out so um we thought it would be a good a good thing to try and to go along with our metal work and um, we started to try and find inspiration for what we should make by looking at a lot of the sort of really early bronze age artifacts and we had a great time we visited lots of museums british museum has an amazing collection of bronze age artifacts and what became more and more and more interesting to us was was that those artifacts were often inspired by stories, myths, legends, um, and a lot of them were things that we would take to be Irish, but actually when we, when we looked a bit further, we realized that the same stories and the same themes crop up in Wales and in Scotland and right into France and Spain and across all of the sort of Celtic nations and right into Canada as well, we find the same themes and the same stories recurring. So we just find that really interesting, that notion of, you know, storytelling around a fireside and how wide a story can spread and how our ancestors were, you know, telling those stories to each other and to their children. Uh, and and it, it went so far, even before they were ever written down. A lot of them were written down in some of the really earliest texts, texts but they were so widespread, they must have been told and retold long before those texts were ever written down. So that, I mean, that's really interesting to us. Um, so the whole collection of bronze sculptures, and there, there is other artwork as well that we've teamed up with other artists to collaborate with. And indeed the, the stories, we've written up the stories, um, are all inspired by those sort of early legends um, of the Celts. So this piece, for example, um, this is based on an, an Ogham or own stone. Uh, you would find these mostly in Ireland, but also in Wales, also in Scotland. And it's inspired by the most amazing story about storytelling. And it's a story about how all the poets in Ireland who were really celebrated in their day because their craft was so cherished, um, forgot the craft of storytelling. And um, you need to go and read the full story. We haven't time to go through them all today, but um, it's a fabulous story um, about how the Irish recovered the art of storytelling uh, and have never lost it since. And you'll see in the story, it features a stone like this and written up the side of the stone is, um, this is Ogham writing for Virgoso, which is an ancient form of the name Fergus. Uh, so you need to read the story to understand the, the background behind that. Um, we, uh, that's the sort of first piece, I'll leave that in just a minute. There's another, um, this is a little, one of the earliest pieces that we made yeah, actually, this one. one. Of um, this is a little cauldron, we call this the Cauldron of Bran. And this is based on a Welsh story. Uh, about a, a king and uh, who went to war with the Irish. Uh, as always, and um, this, it's polished on the inside, and it, it's very hard to see on camera, but there are little etchings around the, the this band here, which took a long time to do, and those were inspired by some of the etchings from the Gundestrat cauldron, which is a very famous Celtic artifact. 
So that's the, the Welsh cauldron. And the story of that cauldron is um, in the legend, it was a cauldron that could, could restore health and bring people back to life. And we also have, again, an early piece called The Salmon of Knowledge. And this is based on a, a story about Finn McCool. Now, a lot of people, especially if you're Scottish, um, you will know the story of Finn McCool, the giant. And it's heavily connected with the Giant's Causeway here in Northern Ireland. And uh, there's lots of legends about Finn McCool. He was a real giant in Celtic mythology. And there's lots and lots of stories written about him. But this is actually from one uh, of, about his childhood and how he got all his wisdom from a salmon. And depending on where you read the story, the salmon lived in possibly the River Boyne or possibly the River Bush. Or um, there's, there's a lot of places that claim that story. Um, this piece is based on the story of Neve and Oshin and the, the fairy horse which emerged out of the sea uh, to carry Oshin off to the, the land of Tirmnod, the land the, the, beyond the sea. Uh, so that, that's the collection and for each of the pieces there are um, artworks by an artist called David Rooney, an Irish artist, and by Claire who happens to be my sister and also a very talented artist. Uh, and we have also created a collection of little cards. And these little cards feature artwork by Claire and by David. And on the back, they've got the, the full story, the full legend. So there's nice little sets of those available on the, on the website if you're interested in reading the stories. I'm gonna let Charlie though now talk about the, the process. Do you want me to put yeah, the- Yeah, you put on that. I'll try and share some photos with you so that you can see. There we go, hopefully you can see that. So initially what we do, what I do is I make the model in clay. So the, and then I'll, and the, I don't know, the next one is me putting on, mm -hmm. uh, covering on that, which will make a, an imprint of the clay model. It's, Whenever we take it apart, it allows you to make the 12 pieces. We only make 12 of each piece. Mm -hmm. So and then we'll uh, pour wax into them. It's worth mentioning, actually, just when you say we only make 12 pieces, each piece is, is numbered uh, yes. and it has a, a Malin mark on it as well. And we keep a register of where all the pieces go. Yeah, and who has them mm -hmm. all over the world. Mm -hmm. so, so then we'll make a wax version of that. And then we fill or we'll put a ceramic shell on that, which is basically similar to what they used to do in Bronze Age, except that they used horse manure, you know, and they dipped it in and taken it out again. You know, so you do that over several layers, you know. So it so takes a wee while. Oh, you'd have to examine my beard to see. <laughs> <that>. <laughs> it can take so that, yeah, it, it depends on the weather and stuff like that. Uh, so warm. Time will take a lot shorter, a couple of days, weeks, each, each jar, mm -hmm. you know, and you can do up to five or six jars depending on the size of the piece. Mm -hmm. so again, then you'll melt the wax out of that, you know, and that'll leave you with a hollow piece that will allow the bronze to be poured into that section. And this is the way the bronze comes to us and it's, you know, which we cut up because when we put them in, it takes a lot less time for them to melt down than it does. And whenever you go to pour it, you've melted the wax out of it and you heat up the piece so that there's no moisture anywhere near it. And as you see, I've built it into the sand. So because I do most of this process by myself, uh, that just holds it in place for me. And then I can pour the molten bronze in and then I let that sit for probably all night anyway, like, you know, to let it cool down and stop it from And here's a wee video of us doing a pour. There it is, it works. It should be working there. Yeah. That's Charlie putting his gloves yes. on. So health and safety is <laughs> <laughs> something. It's worth saying, before Charlie ever goes to do the, the hot work, and yes. especially if I'm helping him, yeah. um, which sometimes we have to do if it's a particularly heavy piece, you need somebody on the other end of the, the pour. 
um, we always do a cold rehearsal yes. first. Um, so the dance it, of the core. The dance of the core. So everything's choreographed before you get into doing yeah. this kind of work because it's... Just to make just sure you're not going to check over a wire, you don't forget something, mm -hmm. you know, because it's kind of like, you know, you have to get the beyond in a great temperature. Otherwise, if it solidifies, that would be better. It won't go into all, it will get finer detail. It's a real um, art getting everything to exactly the right point, and you need a real eye to be yes. able to see when it's right. So that's the, the hot bronze. What temperature is that actually? That's 79, 1200 degrees. So it is. So, so you don't want you to don't, make any mistakes. And, but doing it in sand because if you done it in the concrete floor, it would explode, mm -hmm. and the concrete would explode up around you. So you have plenty of sand around you so that the bees absorbed into it, mm -hmm. you know. And this is after 12 hours, you know, overnight, basically, you know, so we're taking it out, you know, and you can see it's still a bit of heat there, like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there is, um, this is the really exciting bit of the process, yeah, I guess, it because at this stage you've spent maybe, you know, six months yeah. working on a piece. Um, yeah, and, and you building. don't know if it's going to come out right or not like you know you don't so there's you always know. a real sense of drama when we get to this point and uh, apologies for the camera work there's a bit of uh, stuff in the way but hopefully you can see you're cracking open the shell yeah and, so this is album stone coming so out this is this this piece um coming out of the shell right. so i'll just stop and show you that's it that's everything so when it comes out, I don't know if you can see very clearly there, but when it comes out, it's this kind of um, really quite bright, right, bronzy colour. Bronze. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, the next step then is is to uh, apply some kind of patination. And there, there's lots of ways of doing that, about yes. different chemicals you could apply and all that kind of stuff. And we're trying to move away from the chemicals. Mm -hmm. So we're now looking into where certain plants are growing mm -hmm. because then they'll take the piece out and they'll bury it beside certain plants. Like, you know, we've got ours just growing down beside the river. So they'll put a red color into it, you mm -hmm. know, and if we go to a more copper area, like, you know, we'll get more copper coat on it. So, it, so it adds about six months to the process, the process yeah. because you, you, you bury them uh, in different places around the farm and uh, mark them clearly yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, you know it needs about six months in the ground to develop the, the patination and um, but we just think it's a really you know it's such a natural way of doing it because that's how patination actually develops and um, so we we have done that with this this one was done that way yes and uh, once it comes up we can use uh, beeswax or um, we make our own polish actually from linseed and beeswax and um, which when we apply that then that's it um, sealed so the patination will stay on it at that point. So I think that's the whole process covered, isn't it? I think so. And um, we'd love some questions. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I personally have some questions. That's, that's fascinating what a long process wow it so, is yeah so you said some of the pieces take six months to create at, at least yeah. that's probably a minimum actually yeah for some of the stuff yeah yeah Can do. we have these little napkin rings we've been working on for example um which we made from gorse uh it's from the big branches in the gorse tree and they just take forever because you have to cut the piece and cut the middle out of it and you know there's a, uh, a whole lot of them um, a lot of learning in it because then yeah. it'll crack on you and you have to start again and then you know oh, you there's so many fragile stages to the process that you know where, where things can go wrong and uh, i i was bringing up a wax shell today and broke the tail off on the sand. Actually, speaking of the shells, um, we have a guest asking, "What was the shell made of? What what is it made of?" It's it's called molochite, um, so it's like a, a a grain. So so we use that, uh, but it's as Charlie very, said, grades of sand yeah. basically, you know, but the oh. really type stuff like yeah, that. it's called it's called molochite, yeah. and there's different um, grades of it, as Charlie says, so you can you put it on at different stages. 
and but as Charlie was saying in the Bronze Age, it would have been coarse manure and straw was wow. what would have been to make the to make the shell. So we haven't tried that. But. Um. <laughs> Amazing. And so how much are your pieces retailing for at the moment on your shop? Yeah, well, they, they, they vary from, uh, I, mean, I think we're probably the widest ranging price range uh, in the whole show because they vary from <laughs> um, it's £10 for a set of, of four of the cards, um, right. which have all the stories on the back. Uh, oh, yeah. I think the, you know, the sort of top end of the, the horse, which is 1850 Thank you. Brilliant. Wow. That, that is actually fascinating. Well, um, so, I mean, how, what would you say is your favorite piece? I know that I, I hate asking artists that, but I am curious. You, you can say yours first, turn in and I'll say mine. <laughs> so what is my favorite piece? I'll say my first while Charlie's thinking about it. Will I? Yeah. Um, we we have uh, I mean I think this piece is really special to me the the cauldron there's just something so beautiful about it and it's I don't know if you can see very well it's really highly polished on the inside so it's it it kind of glows uh, in the light which I think is really beautiful and it actually makes the most gorgeous sound um, which is because uh, it is like a little bell in some way so um, I really love this piece in the in the band right and everything. One of my favorites. I did love as well. Charlie had made a really beautiful hair, yeah. um, which was a beautiful piece as well. But as we were saying, we only make twelve. It's a really small, limited edition, and um, so those are those are sold out now. Uh, yeah. So we have to work on a different a different piece now to replace those. Well, my favorite piece is the raven, <laughs> but we've sold out of it as well. You know, but. The horse now would be fine. The horse is beautiful, yeah. 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 Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that lovely talk. That was really interesting to see the whole process and also the video was really great. Um, I didn't realize it took so much to create a bronze sculpture, so that's fascinating. Yeah. We weren't and sure we would have time to tell the whole stories, but um you, you can read some of the stories on the back of the cards and they are really um really entertaining and fascinating. Wonderful um, Celtic legends. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, please feel free to visit Helen and Charlie's shop during the show. All of their products will be available for purchase. So please do have a stop by and have a shop. <laughs>